The story of the southwest town of Collie is deeply entwined with the coal and power generation industries. Of course, coal today is a dirty word, but it has to be admitted that without coal, the state, indeed Australia itself, would not have managed to progress very far at all. Because of its association with coal and power production, Collie was at one time seen as little more than just a coal town. Bit by bit, Collie has transformed from a less than attractive coal mining area into one of the most attractive areas in WA. Before we have a look at the Collie of today, surrounded by farms and forests, it's worthwhile looking back to the initial discovery of coal and the mystery that still surrounds the discovery today. As with many things that involve money, the discovery of coal is a tale of double dealing and underhanded acts. The most likely version of events goes something like this. In 1839, the colonial government offered a reward of four square miles of land to anybody discovering a considerable bed of coal anywhere south of Shark Bay. The reward was claimed by A.C. Gregory after the discovery of coal on the Irwin River. Unfortunately, however, the find did not prove to be of commercial value and nothing else of significance was found for a long time. The 1880s rolled around and George Marsh is working for Mr Perrin and herding stock along the Collie River, near where West Collie stands today. George set a fire one evening and over time the rocks he used to surround the fire began to catch fire themselves and by morning all that was left of them was ash. At this point, the story begins to take twists and turns. Now George was either totally ignorant of coal and its nature, or, according to others, he was from mining stock in South Wales and knew very well what he had found. In any case, he reported the find to his employer Perrin, and very soon afterward he found himself on his way to another job a long, long way from the coal discovery site. Perrin certainly knew what the discovery meant and that it could be valuable if a seam of coal could be uncovered. Unfortunately, he found nothing for the next seven years. Then he fell ill and fearing he was about to die, he passed the secret on to his brother John. John was not as tight-lipped as his brother and let the secret of the coal find out on a trip to Bunbury. The information reached the ears of one David Hay. Hay was a local businessman and he quickly proposed to join forces with Perrin, who by now had recovered from his illness. An agreement was signed on the 23rd of September 1889. Hay had a partner named Dixon and the pair quickly marked out large claims around the initial discovery site and failed to mention this to Perrin. It didn't take long for Perrin to find out about the double dealing and the partnership then soured somewhat. Hay had been busily prospecting on his own claims and quickly found a seam of coal. A ton of it was delivered to Bunbury and burned at an exhibition fire in the showgrounds in November. Hay, to the consternation of Perrin, was then named discoverer of the coal by the state premier, Broom. When the government belatedly offered a reward of £1,000 for the discovery of an adequate coal field within 60 miles of a port, Hay and Perrin both submitted claims. An inquiry was established to find out the truth of the matter and eventually came up with the conclusion that the reward would be split 50-50 between the two men. No mention was ever made of poor old George Marsh, who had died of a fever not long after starting his new employment. Government, as governments do, took a long time to agree with what the inquiry had recommended, and by the time they finally got around to paying the reward, it was David Hay's widow who received his share. Whatever the truth of the discovery, the future of the yet-to-be-established town of Collie was ensured. Collie was to become the central hub of power generation for Perth and the metropolitan area. The power plant 
was named Muja, which is the Aboriginal name for the cabbage tree. At the time of making this video, parts of the Muja power station have been mothballed, and what remains operating is expected to cease power production in 2029. Muja is listed as one of the worst emitters of air pollution in Australia, but it still had a very important role to play in the development of Western Australia. The town of Collie was named after Dr Alexander Collie, who was a surgeon aboard the HMS Sulphur that sailed with the Parmelia to the Swan River colony. Collie joined Lieutenant Preston on a journey from Coburn Sound to Geograph Bay in November 1829. They discovered two rivers, later named by Governor Stirling, the Collie and the Preston. The town site of Collie was declared in 1896, and with the solid economic base of coal, the town grew steadily to become one of the most important inland towns in the state. Timber was produced in abundance from the surrounding hardwood forests, and agriculture sprang up on the periphery. But all these were subsidiary to the production of coal. Coal and coal-related industry was Collie's main economic base. Collie and Collie Cardiff were originally two separate towns. The known history of Cardiff can be neatly divided into two periods. The mining era from 1902 until 1960 and the present era. Cardiff was originally a timber camp, but with the opening of the coal mine in 1903, the population swelled as miners and their families settled close to the mine. Bound by close ties of kinship, school, work, union and sporting loyalties, the Cardiff folk made up a colourful and tight-knit community. The closure of the school at the end of 1950 saw a gradual decline in Cardiff, even before the mine closure in December 1960, families started moving into Collie for greater comfort. There's far more to the Collie story than I can hope to include in this video. And I currently have at least four large books dealing with the subject. If you want to find out a bit more about the town and its history, I'm going to put a link below that'll take you to our Collie page on our main website. Well, that brings us to today and the transformation of Collie from an ugly coal mining area to one dominated by lakes and forests. Luckily, as many of the mines closed, the sites have been turned into recreation areas, and many are very attractive. A mine called Stockton operated as an underground operation in 1927, and changed to open cut mining in 1943 before closing in 1957. The Stockton mine has become Lake Stockton and is surrounded by forest. Here you can camp and go boating on the lake, which thanks to the minerals in the water is slightly acidic and has a vivid blue colour. Other mines have been developed as recreational areas, including Kipwari, that's now an extensive campground and water playground for the southwest. The open cut mine that used to exist here was closed in 1996 and the large pit quickly filled with water. While we're on the subject of water in the Collie area, it's impossible not to mention the huge expanse of Wellington Dam. The dam was constructed in 1933 and the water is used mostly for irrigation as it's unsuitable for drinking. It's an immensely popular place for camping fishing, swimming, and generally enjoying nature. There are organised national park campsites at Honeymoon Pool and Potter's Gorge, and if you head to the southern end of the dam along some winding bush roads, you'll find some amazing freeform camping right by the edge of the water. Collie has exceptional facilities for visitors, and the best place to start your visit is the local visitor centre. Near the centre, you'll find some old steam trains that once dominated the railways in the area. Sadly, the large and rather interesting train turntable is yet to be recognised for its historic value, 
and has not been developed into what could really become a wonderful attraction. It sits fading away on private property and it is something we think is very worthwhile developing. There is, however, an amazing railway restoration workshop in town where the rusting relics are brought back to life by an army of hard-working volunteers. Next to the workshop is an old goods shed that contains a carriage cafe and a terrific weekend market. It was whispered to me while I was there that the carriage cafe serves the best cooked breakfast you'll find anywhere. Just across the road is the main part of town where you can walk past some lovely old heritage buildings while you check out the local shops. Back out near the visitors centre is the wonderful Collie Museum. Here you can immerse yourself in the history of the area and learn about life at a time when modern conveniences that we all have today simply didn't exist. Collie is one of those areas that really has it all but for some reason it remains a bit underrated by tourists. The picturesque dams and lakes, the glorious forests, the meandering river that flows down from the hills to the coastal plain and out into the sea at Australind. There's just so much to see and enjoy in this area and it's only a couple of hours drive from Perth. We've always loved the Collie area, but sadly we never seem to find quite enough time to get out there and enjoy it as we would like to.